Hello, my name is John Clymer and I'm Director of Bands at the Peck School of the Arts at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. A work that I've enjoyed rehearsing and performing with young musicians over the years is Courtly Airs and Dances by Ron Nelson. As the composer states in the preface to the score, the work is a suite of Renaissance dances characteristic to five European countries during the 16th century. Courtly Airs and Dances is beautifully orchestrated and offers unique opportunities to teach a variety of styles. The purpose of this video is to share some interpretive suggestions and rehearsal techniques for selected passages within this work. While watching the presentation, it would be helpful for you to have a score available for reference. The first movement of Courtly Airs and Dances entitled Entrada serves as a short fanfare to the dances that comprise the suite. The first stylistic consideration I would like to share with you has to do with unifying the articulation and note links in the beginning trumpet fanfare. One of the first things to decide is whether or not you want the accented quarter notes separated, and if so, how much. I think it was prudent that Mr. Nelson used traditional accents instead of marcato accents, as young players often see marcato and place too much emphasis on the front end of the note, causing a harsh and overly accented articulation. I believe the indication non legato, just before the initial trumpet entrance, should be interpreted as a way to provide clarity in articulation of rhythm, rather than an indication to play each note short. I like to rehearse this passage by asking the students to play everything connected without accents, focusing on consistency of tone and rhythm. It is especially important to emphasize the accurate subdivision of the 16th note pulse to be sure the dotted 8th note 16th note rhythm is played correctly. Once those concepts are established, I bring back the idea of accents by asking students to put a little weight on the beginning of each note and, if necessary, a slight amount of space between the last two eighth notes. I've found that when I focus on articulation, the non-legato fanfare style is appropriately achieved. At this time, I'd like to introduce one of my faculty colleagues at UW-Milwaukee, Associate Professor of Horn Greg Flint, who will share some tips about the opening stopped horn passage in the first movement. Greg? Thank you, John. When a composer asks for stopped horn, they'll often put a plus sign over the music uh, it may even uh, just be written out as stopped horn or say gestopped, which is German for that. When the composer does not want you to play stopped, following the passage they'll put an O or say open. At the beginning of Courtly Airs and Dances, it has a very prominent uh, stopped horn section sound on a, starting on a written C. To play stopped horn, the horn player basically takes their right hand, hinges it a little bit like a, uh, like a door, and, and very firmly and aggressively places it into the bell. You can almost squeeze the horn to, to uh, make that seal happen. Uh, what it produces is a sound or a very nasal quality sound. Because of the resi resistance provided by your hand, you have to blow harder and straighter and more aggressively. You're squeezing the horn and blowing very hard. The one thing you have to do in stopped horn is finger a half step lower on the F side of your instrument. Fingering a half step lower, you're transposing down a half step. So to play this C, I play a B natural. I finger a B natural. And to play the G below, I would finger an F sharp right below that on the F horn. Now, very sized hands and different sized bells make stopping sometimes a bit difficult for some players. And a good alternative to that is a stopped mute, which works the same way as the hand. Uh, goes in there quite firmly. You do finger a half step lower. It can provide a very cutting sound. And this is also a very useful mute when you go a lower or below middle C in the horn register. If you need to make a quick change, if the music happens very, change happens very quickly, you can hang it like this place it in the bell. Uh, if that, if one does not have a stop mute, a regular straight mute can also uh, be a good substitute. Um, it does not have the nasal quality of the stop sound. But can be, can be, can be uh, used. You do not have to transpose when you use this mute. You can play just the notes as written. Uh, stop horn is a, something that, that Nobody else in the band gets to do, so enjoy it, and, and like any technique, you may have to practice it quite a bit to master it. Thank you very much. 
Movement two is a bassa dance from France. The scoring in the first 24 measures is quite transparent with solo parts for oboe, clarinet, bassoon, horn, and tenor drum. The opening eight bar phrase is followed by a second statement of the theme for a brass quartet consisting of trumpet, horn, trombone, and baritone. As you can see on the score, the composer has cross-cued the parts to allow for a variety of combinations of instruments to meet the needs and capabilities of each ensemble. The first two phrases of this movement, up to measure 16, is chamber music, and as such it provides a great opportunity to allow the players to perform on their own. The, the only challenge is coordinating the tenor drum part, since in a traditional seating arrangement that player may be too far from the other performers, creating ensemble precision problems. Something I have tried on several occasions is to place the woodwinds, horn, and percussionist in front of the ensemble to the conductor's left, and the brass quartet in a similar seating arrangement on the conductor's right. A small drum like a tabor works particularly well, and of course a standard snare drum with snares off will work just fine. Moving these chamber groups to the side of the band allows for a unique sound and results in better balance in those passages. The players can remain in this seating arrangement for the entire movement and return to their seats for movement three. As is the case with many of Ron Nelson's works, there are extensive and interesting percussion parts throughout. He also does a wonderful job of integrating the wind in percussion parts. One such example is the opening of movement three, where the second and third flute parts provide added color to the four-voice marimba and vibraphone part. The fourth movement represents the saltarello, a lively Italian dance from the late 14th century. Conductors should note the designation by the composer for bass drum with attached cymbal. This setup was used in the orchestral music of Mahler and allows the player the opportunity for greater precision between the two parts. The downside is the tone quality of the cymbal can be affected depending on how it's mounted to the drum. This technique was also popular in band music where Sousa's favorite bass drummer, Gus Helmack, was well known for his mastery of this technique. The decision to utilize attached symbol would obviously be dependent upon whether or not you have that setup, but it does provide a unique color and conductors should consider this as an option. The important thing to remember is that the parts must be played simultaneously. In other words, bass drum and cymbal sound on each dotted quarter note. After the percussion introduction, the melody appears first in the solo flute part. The theme is presented a total of six times and is orchestrated in a variety of instruments throughout the movement. I like to encourage the musicians to think of this melody in one, as it allows for more direction and flow to the line. I would also suggest a very light and separated approach to the eighth notes. This will serve as a nice contrast to the dotted quarter notes which are marked tenuto and should be performed with a slight amount of weight throughout. The majority of the fifth movement provides a wonderful opportunity for students to use their voices as the players sing the melodic material accompanied by percussion and a few supporting instruments. The orchestration is unique and serves as a contrast to the other movements. The thematic material in the final Allemande is reminiscent of the opening entrada. In the first half of the work, the orchestration alternates between full and chamber-like passages and offers an additional opportunity for creative staging of personnel. Beginning in measure 17 and again in measure 33, consider placing the quartet consisting of flute, oboe, clarinet, and horn in front of the ensemble to provide stylistic contrast. Courtly Airs and Dances is one of my favorite works for young musicians. The historical concepts and musical styles within this work offer a rich and varied platform for teaching and learning.